Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. Oliver North captured the imagination of the American viewing public via the drama of live television. Was he an American hero or was he merely a marine vigilante? A lot of questions have been asked, few answers uh, to the satisfaction of everyone. Questions of separations of powers, of checks and balances. We've heard from Oliver North, we've heard from John Poindexter, we've heard from Robert McFarlane. Today we're going to hear from Ball State University professors and their response to the Iran-Contra hearings. They are Earl Kahn, who is chairman of the Department of Journalism, Tom Sargent, professor of political science, and John Rouse, producer of Public Affairs Roundtable and a member of the political science department. John, is Oliver North or John Poindexter or none of the above, are these American heroes? Well, you have to ask, who is an American hero? Joe DiMaggio retired from baseball in the early 1950s. He is considered a hero. In fact, he is known also as Mr. Coffee. He sells coffee. Uh, Colonel North is not yet selling coffee. Maybe after 30 years we can find out if Mr. North is indeed a hero. But it'll take some time for him to be uh, installed as a real hero. So he has not yet replaced Joe DiMaggio. Okay, he is a hero perhaps if you support his values. If you support values, for, for example, like authority, the authority of the executive to implement uh, policies uh, that are even in, co in contradiction to the laws of Congress. He is a hero if you uh, feel it's okay to support a program that was based upon a series of lies. He is a hero if uh, you support the Contras and you think that the Contra movement is a value that is above so many other values in society. He is a hero if uh, you agree with his means and even his ends. So he is a hero in the minds of people who agree, who agree with his values. Now in terms of evidence, the Gallup poll, which was taken for Newsweek, said that 28% would vote for Mr. North for public office. But only 17% said that he had a right to lie to Congress. A New York Times CBS poll said that only 18% rated him as a national hero. An LA Times poll stated that only 4% described him as a hero. A hero in long-term uh, focus is a person with whom we agree with their values. Uh, so I don't think we know for sure if Mr. North or Colonel North is going to be a hero in the sense that Joe DiMaggio is still a hero. In the short-term definition of hero, are we also not talking about liking his image? And certainly, Earl, television allows someone to project an image to the American public. Certainly, being on television six or seven days consecutively in the spotlight, uh, you can pretty much establish an image that you want people to, to have of you. Has not the images of, have not the images of, of North and Poindexter somewhat overshadowed uh, some of the substance of the hearings? Well, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, uh, the American public would be hard pressed at this point, I would guess, to even know what the substance is. <laughs> what are we talking about? The point is Oliver North. Uh, it's interesting that uh, John Poindexter showed up at the hearings in civilian dress. Uh, he is a rear admiral. He could have uh, been there in full military regalia with all the gold braid and battle stars and ribbons and what have you, but he chose not to do that. He was asked by, a rep probably more than one, but he was asked by reporters why he didn't. And his answer was, this is not a naval matter, and so it was not appropriate for me to show up in naval dress. Well, by implication, um, that must either mean then that Colonel North thought his appearance was a marine matter, or he was inappropriately dressed, one, one of the, or both, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So you can only um, wonder what all that means. The, the facts, however, are that uh, if we were to poll the American public about how many people knew why Poindexter chose to show up in a blue suit, I would doubt that one in a hundred would know. 
but 100 out of 100 would, or something close to that, would be very aware of Oliver North's appearance. Uh, John Wayneish uh, or uh, Gary Cooperish or whatever he was in his military uniform. <clears throat> That's not to criticize him necessarily. He's free to make whatever choice he wishes, but I think it is a comment on how the public perceives these people. Should, I don't know how to phrase this question, but does not then the medium, in this case television, get in the way of the substance of the issue? Well, uh, that could take uh, more time than we have <laughs> to talk about whether the medium gets in the way. In, in the short term answer, I suppose the, the answer would be yes. If, if by that we mean are people so caught up in the impression the person makes um, that they miss the substance of what the debate is all about. You know, if it's couched in those terms, then yes, I suppose the medium gets in the way. But in another sense, I don't agree with that because uh, the medium only gets in the way if we allow it. No one says that as a viewer I must sit there and be awed by Colonel Norris' uniform and his demeanor. No one says that I cannot listen to what is said and make my own judgment about that. Can I just raise a couple issues? One is that uh, I didn't have the benefit of television to uh, watch this. Uh, I had to hear some of it on radio and I listened to two or three hours of it at various times uh, on radio. And I must say that without television, North comes across in a very effective way. Just to listen to the man, he is arti amazingly articulate. At one point on the line in the early stages of this, I asked myself, what is some lieutenant colonel, a field grade officer, doing with the kind of uh, power, apparently, and influence that he has in the National Security Council staff? Well, it's clear from his uh, comments that he's a very articulate guy. We agree with him or not. He's a very articulate guy and gets those points across. Second point, like raise one is uh, partly in response to you, John, with regard to the heroism or hero status of uh, Oliver North. Um, my impression is that polls which have been taken indicate the American people still believe that uh, the president was n is not telling the truth and are not all that supportive of the total concept of the uh, uh, policies which North was uh, running or advocating. So my, my point is that probably uh, they might, may like Oliver North, the person, on television, but not necessarily support the policies which he's advocating on television. Is that fair or not? Yeah, yeah. Isn't, isn't that where Ronald Reagan has stood for some time? Is that <laughs> while he might be personally popular with the American people, it doesn't necessarily mean they support his policies. In no, I, case, I, that's right. I, I hmm. think it's very likely that you can uh, like a person as a person, but uh, not agree with the person's perspective about certain kinds of policies. Let me raise these kinds of questions. We really have to focus, I think, on this program, uh, how Hoosiers respond to these issues. And let me just raise a couple of things I, I think might be worth uh, discussing. Hoosiers perhaps would support Mr. North because Hoosiers respect authority, including the values of family, the acceptance of authority and the prerogatives of authority, support systems of accountability and responsibility up the chain of command. So in their very being, Hoosiers would tend to support Mr. North. However, Hoosiers are also people of common sense thinkers. And uh, I think that in a sense, as common sense thinkers, uh, Hoosiers are very common sense kind of thinking kind of people. The, the, they become very concerned about the administration's attempt to trade arms for hostages. And so for some time, the American public, in, including Hoosiers, have been educated about Iran. And the regime in, in Iran, I believe, is, is accepted by many Americans as being one that they abhor, that they do not agree with those kinds of values. So in that sense, uh, I think on one hand, Hoosiers support authority, and they would like to uh, support the president. On the other hand, they are common sense thinkers, and they ask the question, how could the president have not known? Well, can I just raise a couple of issues there, too? Um, clearly, one of, the, one of the major Hoosiers involved, <clears throat> involved in this whole pro uh, process was uh, Lee Hamilton, the uh, congressman from the 9th Congressional District. Uh, and his point, of course, was, uh, well, several, but one of them was that this whole thing was a series of lies which uh, had been perpetrated by the administration. 
Um, Congressman Hamilton is as popular a congressman in this state as we're going to find any place. He has as safe a seat as there is available anywhere. And so clearly he represents some kind of thinking on the part of the American people. Second point I'd raise with regard to the congressman, John, you and Earl and uh, Larry all remember last spring when he was here, uh, he made some comments uh, on the Ball State campus about the relationship between Congress and the president and foreign policy. And uh, his point then was that uh, this was a very serious problem in the sense of a conflict between Congress and the president. And he was deeply concerned about the attempts by the president to go around Congress. His feeling was clearly that Congress should be consulted, and in the end, a healthy dialogue would improve our foreign policy rather than destroy it. And I think this is, in part, the question about which all of this, uh, these hearings revolve. Wouldn't it not be better for there to have been a healthy, quotation marks, dialogue between Congress and the president in this matter of foreign policy than this kind of covert thing, which in the end, as the congressman said, accomplished less than nothing. Yeah, if, if I could follow up on your point and ask both Earl and, and Tom, it, it seems to me that in the Indiana culture, everything is focused upon partisanship. Uh, so, so, so Indiana is a state of, of great contest for political office, partisans, partisans, partisans. Picking up on the Lee Hamilton theme, as Lee Hamilton seems to come off as a nonpartisan, and you see Senator Rudman, for example, agreeing with Lee Hamilton. So let me ask: Do you think that this issue is a political issue, or is it, or, or is it one of nonpartisanship, where both Republicans and Democrats in Congress agree that there's a real concern about this relationship between the President and the Congress? Well, if the issue you're describing is the relationship between the President and the Congress, then I think it is not a partisan issue, fundamentally. I think it's, uh, it, is a, it is a political issue, but not a partisan issue. You with me on that, John? Okay. The, the difference I'm trying to make? But if you're talking about uh, the fact that this is 1987 and next year is 1988 and there's going to be a presidential election next year, then clearly the Democrats, perhaps leaving Congressman Hamilton aside, uh, are interested <laughs> in what's going to, in, in the implications for uh, President Reagan uh, that will come out of these hearings. I don't think there's any question about that. But I think the basic issue is a, a nonpartisan one. I think, yeah, as, as a newsman, that's worthy of the American people's skepticism that, sure, this is 1987 and we're concerned about the separation of powers. We're concerned about Congress's role in making foreign policy. But yes, next year we must keep in the back of our minds is 1988. Mm -hmm. And certainly not every member of the panel and not every congressman is apolitical or a partisan in this case. I, you know, I find a paradox here when you talked about the Hoosiers, John. Uh, are we talking about the Hoosier values of a Lee Hamilton or the Hoosier values of a John Poindexter, who's also from Indiana? Uh, can we categorize these values as being Hoosier? And, or are, is there a lot of, of, of cross-reference there? Is there a lot of agreement really fundamentally between Lee Hamilton and John Poindexter? Just yeah, well, see, see uh, Poindexter and North and Secord and, and McFarland, they're all left brain thinkers. Now, um, I guess I'll better explain that. Poindexter, for the most part, left this state about 30 years ago, and he hasn't been back, you know, except to come see family, I guess. He went to the Naval Academy. He has a PhD in a very uh, technical, analytical kind of way. And a left brain thinker would be a person who focuses upon the analytical, uh, looks at the trees, not the forest, looks at the smaller picture, not the broader one, uh, as I said, is analytical and, and not so much, so much conceptual. Whereas Lee Hamilton, working in Congress, is a right brain thinker. And he's looking at the broader picture. He's looking at the conceptual in terms of how these issues float not just with the Contras or Iran, but how they deal with the overall concerns of our society. So... Are you saying Lee Hamilton has stayed in touch with Hoosier values and, and Poindexter has become sort of a, a tool of the military-industrial <laughs> complex? I mean, is no, that what... No, I, I, I'm saying in a sense, see, see Lee Hamilton has to re represent or does represent about a half a million people. And those half a million people have all kinds of views about everything in society. And so therefore he has to be open in terms of his channels to so many diverse interests. Mr. Poindexter, representing the bureaucracy, is open to the channels of, of chain of command. 
And so they have a very different responsibility, accountability focus. Uh, Lee Hamilton being responsible to a very broad-based group of people, Mr. Poindexter, Mr. McFarland, Mr. North, Mr. Secord, all military officers, keep in mind, are responsible to a chain of command. So they, they have more narrow interest. Uh, uh, so that's my best answer for you. <laughs> OK, I'll buy that. <laughs> Tom, let's go back to the, a point you made about uh, at Lee Hamilton's appearance here uh, recently here on Ball State's campus, where he talked about mm. the role of Congress in, in foreign policy. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is an issue that is never going to be, I guess, resolved. There's never going to be a, a clear-cut line. Uh, is there likely to be a different kind of relationship evolved between the administration and Congress as a result of these hearings, do you believe? Well, I think there's going to, I think it'll be a different relationship in terms of the credibility of the president and the White House with regard to Congress. Uh, no question about that. I think, indeed, one of the purposes of these hearings, uh, if they have any real purpose, is to explore that relationship and to see whether or not some new public policies might be in, ought to be put in place with regard to, say, the arrangements for the National Security Council. One of the things that intrigues me about this is this isn't the first time these things have happened. Uh, these are, this isn't the first time there have been covert secret operations. And what I'm intrigued by is that if they are successful or if they are part of a broader event which in the end is successful, then they're either excused or forgotten or not even mentioned. And I think particularly uh, came to mind as I was thinking about this that in the uh, period of 1939, 1941, when um, President Roosevelt was uh, clearly on the side of the angels with regard to our entry into World War II, yet opposed by Congress uh, in a very real sense, that he did a lot of things and permitted a lot of things to happen which were covert in nature and which tended to move us in the direction of entry into World War II. Uh, and yet, because we were caught up in a much bigger event, namely the war, and eventually we were on the right side and it was all successful, then nobody says very much now about President Roosevelt's activities. But this operation with regard to hostages and Iran and Contras and Nicaragua has not been successful. It's been a failure. And there's deep controversy still in the country over whether or not we should be involved at all with Iran and whether we should be involved at all with Nicaragua. And so the attitudes of various groups, including Congress, are different now from what they might have been otherwise. I find the whole thing kind of a fascinating contradiction in terms, and it's going to keep on occurring as uh, executives and presidents, which have, who have enormous power at their disposal, see problems they think ought to be solved, and they feel themselves uh, encumbered or restrained by a Congress who really doesn't know all the facts. And so uh, they go ahead and do things or say, won't somebody get rid of this troublesome priest <laughs> for me, yeah. and go and, and somebody goes and does it for them. Well, well, isn't part of the problem here, though, that uh, not only did Congress not know all the facts, but the chief executive, the president, didn't obviously know didn't know right. all the facts. Well, I, yeah, I'm being rhetorical of that, <laughs> yeah. right, you know, but I, I think that's right. Uh, and one point that's been raised is nobody in the State Department uh, at any kind of operating level was consulted about this, these operations. They were not involved, apparently, at the operating level. I'm talking now about under assistant secretaries, under the assistant secretary level, below the assistant secretary level, were not involved. No experts on Iran, no experts in Nicaragua, no experts on anything of that sort were involved in these operations, but some lieutenant colonel. Right. The, the Department of State and the Department of Defense, of course, or the cabinet agencies that have the experts who study these issues all of their lives. And the National Security Council is an organization that does not have cabinet status but is directly responsible to the president. And so in a sense, if the president has a particular policy, perhaps he could circumvent these other agencies. Let me uh, ask some questions and also pick up on Could Tom's... Could I go back to your Hoosier comment a minute, okay. uh, John? Um, I talked to a Hoosier, believe it or not, and uh, <laughs> found one. Huh? I found a Hoosier, and I think, incidentally, there's a point that could be made. Can we really talk about such a thing as a Hoosier? Is that a is that a, a categorization that serves us well? Uh, I suspect it is not. Um, Indiana is is as diverse as um, any other segment of our society, and I'm not sure that it's uh, useful to talk about. Uh, 
uh, Hoosier values, if you will. I'm not sure I'd know a Hoosier value <laughs> if I stumbled across one. Um, uh, how long do you, as an example, how long must you live in Indiana before you are a Hoosier and have assimilated these values? Do they change when you go to cross uh, the state line? Yes, yeah. they change when you cross the state line or go to the one of the coast. So I, I'm not sure about that. But uh, in any case, one of these Hoosiers that uh, I talked to um, asked the question about these covert actions that we've been talking about. And I thought there was a woman, I thought she made an interesting point. Covert, act, uh, covert actions or knowledge uh, avail against or available to whom? Certainly the Sandinistas knew everything we were doing. Uh, if we're talking about covert against the Sandinistas, it wasn't covert as far as they're concerned. Um, if, if you can identify anyone against whom these actions were covert, it was probably the American people. They're the ones who don't know what's going on. And then as you've itemized, a number of other people who we might expect and would anticipate ought to be informed were not. I think that's a significant question to ask this administration or FDR or any other administration, covert actions against whom? Well, clearly the American people were not informed, uh, but there were, of course, other foreign governments not informed, and we always hoped in the Iranian deal that the uh, Khomeini leadership was not going to be informed either. Clearly they became informed uh, and so uh, the, in effect the covert operation collapsed because everybody knew about it. I think that's my point mm -hmm. and so ultimately the covert action collapses and the last people to know when everybody else on earth knows are the American people. Now something's gone askew. There's some precedents for that, of course, aren't there? I mean, well, we would personal hope lives. But <laughs> uh, yeah, but we would hope that uh, that would not be the precedent. Sure. As a matter of fact, uh, an editorial that appeared in the New York Times about this issue concluded with this paragraph, and I think it's an excellent paragraph. It discussed what the administration's done, and then it concludes, a president free to do that, and the that would be to wink or even sneer at inconvenient laws, as they put it. A president free to do that is a leader free to do anything. There are some countries where that is true. The United States is not so far one of them. I think to me that says quite a bit about what's happened in our country in uh, recent months and raises the question what we would wish might or might not happen. Errol, I, I want to I kind of <clears throat> disagree with you about Hoosiers. Uh, First of all, this program is only heard in Hoosier land. It's not heard anyplace else. And so Hoosiers want to know about these things in terms of how they look at it. My perspective is that a lot of Hoosiers had rather not know about these things, that they think that authority has a right not to tell the people. Hoosiers are not for equal opportunity, but they're for opportunity. So for everybody to know is an equal issue, and it, it puts everybody on an equal plane. They would like to see Mr. North have some efficiency and bureaucracy to be able to implement these values. And so I, th I think these are very distinct values, and they are values that are perhaps that are different from other states. I think I would disagree. And, uh, <laughs> That's what it, I said. It's certainly, <laughs> uh, there, there's certainly something to be said about a program directed toward Hoosiers. That's a very different thing, however, than... Uh, assuming to speak for Hoosiers. Well, now, John, and just one other point, <laughs> if I may side with Earl here, uh, the, uh, the uh, supreme quintessential person who respected authority was our friend Archie Bunker, who was certainly not uh, a Hoosier. I mean, he was a New Yorker, so uh, maybe those values extend beyond the confines of the Wabash River. Well, as, as, <laughs> as I said, I got a question for you guys. <laughs> all right, uh, all right. It, is it, do you agree with this, that the elites tend to agree more and have more consensus, the Allies, for example, support to some degree the policy to or, or towards Iran, in other words, the flagging of the ships. On the other hand, the elites in society do not agree on Nicaragua. They, there's less consensus about what to do about supporting the Contras. And so the Allies, of course, at the same time, aid the Sandinistas. So my point again is, do you think there's uh, some truth in the statement that we can agree on a foreign policy towards the evil regime in Iran, but at the same time do not agree because there's no consensus about how to, about how to deal with the issue of the Contras. Earl? 
I don't think it has anything to do with elitism. Um, it's uh, very easy. I think uh, you'd get a high percentage of agreement, uh, far beyond elitism, as to our attitude toward Iran. Uh, now, 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 I didn't say elitism. I said the elites of society who, and, and there are scores of elites, I mean, in terms of in different professions and different... Well, I guess I really don't know what you're talking about I'm, then. I'm saying that the, the, the people mm -hmm. who pay attention to these issues, yeah. I mean, the ones who have the intellectual thought on these issues, they don't agree on the contours. I mean, in Congress, for example, the elites in Congress, the leaders of Congress, I should say it perhaps, they do not agree on, on the issue of contra aid, whereas they tend to more agree about the evil nature of the regime in yeah. Iran. And my point is that has nothing to do with the elites any place. That's across the board. That would be a universal opinion held by everybody, whether they're elites or non-elites or anything else. Iran is a very easy matter for us, given where we stand, to agree about, to agree about the Contras or not. Yes, but okay. the point, the, the basic point, though, is that with regard to foreign policy, um, there's been no agreement on the foreign policy towards either country. Um, the policies which the president espoused, namely no talking to terrorists, and in a sense a kind of isolation of Iran, turned out to be just the contrary. And the Europeans certainly didn't support us. Uh, with regard to talking about hostages or trading arms for uh, arms for hostages, and uh, we, you already commented, there's no agreement anywhere about our policy towards Nicaragua. So, so perhaps that answers Larry's first question. That is the reason that North is a hero. He can cut through all this all this indecision and and bureaucracy and vacillation, and so therefore he is a hero because he has a definitive point about things. Simple, straightforward, and clear cut, perhaps, but it uh, doesn't solve the problems of what to do about Iran and what to do about uh, Nicaragua and what to do about uh, hostages uh, and covert operations within the federal government. Uh, none of those problems is solved yeah. by uh, he gives you by a good Lieutenant feeling, Colonel on television. That's right. Anything. Absolutely, couldn't mm -hmm. agree more. And nothing more about congressional mm -hmm. involvement in foreign policy. Nothing more. No, there's no solution nothing to that either. <laughs> All right. We're out of time today. Thanks to our panelists, Tom Sargent, Earl Kahn, and John Rouse for their comments and commentary here today. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Bill Mosier and Mike Seaborg. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.